Hey everybody, welcome back to Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. My name is Mark Pattison, CEO of Finding Your Summit Media Group, and welcome to another amazing podcast. You know, about 30 episodes ago, I had a guy by the name of Kyle Menard on the pod. He actually is a guy that I met uh, as we were both climbing Aconcagua, which is down in Argentina, my fourth summit of the seven. And the one thing that separates between myself and him is he has no arms, no legs. And he had this great quote that came out called, it's not what I can do, it's what I will do. And the person I had on the podcast this week is an amazing soul. Her name, Jean Anderson. If you're from the Pacific Northwest, Seattle in particular, she was a a regular a fixture uh, coming into our living room as a co-anchor for King TV5. She was actually the first woman ever to co-anchor a nightly news. Just well, what a career. I mean, you're talking about a woman who was in all different parts of, of our culture growing up. Um, all these different decades, she interviewed over five presidents, was in China, was in Russia, and really groundbreaking for a lot of the different things that she did. So just an incredible, incredible person. I've gotten to know her now as a friend. We actually uh, met each other in a bar called the Pio here in Sun Valley, Idaho. So a girl and a guy walk into a bar and, and crazy things happen. And in fact, it did that particular night. Ended up having dinner with uh, her uh, significant other, her husband, Bruce, great guy. Just discovered that we have all these things in common. So great conversation. Tune in. Uh, she's very fascinating, okay? So I also want to let everybody know about my e-learning course I've been working on called Finding Your Summit, of course, which is located on my website at www.markpattisonnfl.com where you can receive your free PDF download, which is really the tip of the iceberg of how you can get inspired towards accomplishing something great. You know, these are all lessons I learned from my Hall of Fame coaches way back in the day who taught me about all the different strategies that you and I both need to do to get to to the top of that mountain, and we all need to get there, right? Also over there, we also have a free assessment test of 10 questions, which really helps you measure where you are at in your life. So look, we all want to elevate our game and reach our potential, and certainly this gets you going in the right direction. So check it out, okay? And also, if you've not already done so on iTunes, please go in and rate and review in the Apple world, this all has to do with popularity of your of your show, in this case, Finding Your Summit podcast, uh, showing itself on iTunes. So the more reviews and, and ratings that I get, the more it pops up. And so other people can see all these amazing things these people are doing to inspire us all. Okay. And finally, this podcast is sponsored by Violets Are Blue skincare.com with Cynthia Besteman. She's a rock star as always. She's overcome her own adversity and it's amazing product line. So go check that out. Okay. So listen, let's go listen to Gene. Here we go. Hey everybody, it's Mark. I'm back again with another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this week, I am honored to be broadcasting live in Sun Valley, Idaho, my world HQ. And I am talking with a woman who I literally grew up with. She was in my living room every single night. And... Um, and so her name is Jean Anderson. Jean, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's nice to be here with you, Mark. Okay, so I know that we have now uh, joked around uh, about this a, a couple times, but how we met. So a guy and a girl walk into a bar, literally, and uh, Jean is with her um, husband. I'm with my significant other, and um, it's called the Pio, and the Pio is packed. And so as we sit there, normally there's a gourd, uh, door greeter there to write down your names as... Uh, people wait in line hoping to get sat. And this particular night, it was jam-packed. And so both of us decided to springboard that line and go towards the restaurant um, threshold where the person was about 25 feet away, 30 feet away. And uh, we wanted to see if we could get put on that list so we didn't have to go through the long line. And Gene ends up hitting to this person about the same time that I ran up to this person. And we're both saying, how long is it? It's hour 45 minutes for you. It's an hour, hour 45 minutes for you. And so she looks at me and looks back at the guy and says, well, if we had a table for four, 
how long would that be? And the guy said, 10 minutes. So she looks at me and she says, why don't we have dinner together? And so I knew who Jean was because I'd grown up with her it, it, in my living room. Um, you know, all my uh, young uh, uh, life up until I left to go down to California with the Raiders. And uh, we ended up having dinner in this wonderful time. And so that's how everything got kicked off, Gene. And it's just been amazing to get to know you. And as it turned out, we have all these people in common. And places. And places and people and, sports, and things. And, and sports. And so, I don't know. It, it was just a... It, it, um, there's a there's a guy who kicked off the podcast for me named Yogi Roth. Yogi is a, an announcer for the Pac-12 Network. And uh, he did a pod on me, and recently uh, he got engaged. And he got engaged to the woman that was sitting next to him on an airplane when he was going overseas or Hawaii someplace. And so he made this comment, you know, start up conversations with you people you don't know because you never know where that's going to lead. For him, it's an engagement. And for you and I, now we're friends. We've had dinner a few times together. And and uh, Bruce, your husband, is amazing. And uh, so anyways, I'm very honored. And thank you very much for coming into my life. I'm honored, too. It's fun to do this with you because this is my first podcast for real ever. But, uh, Mark, I think we should tell people why I was in your living room all those years. I mean, it sounds kind of... Exciting, but it's probably not as exciting as people might be thinking that I've been in your living room for years and years and years. Well, that's a, that's a actually an excellent way to tee that thing up. So, Gene um, worked for a, a Wait, local... before you tell this, can yeah, I tell yeah. you my version of how we met? You, okay, go ahead. Okay, so there's this nice looking guy in a bar. And I've been in the bar for exactly 10 seconds while my husband goes out and parks the car. He comes back in exactly 30 seconds, and Mark and I are now fast friends. And my husband's like, I can't leave you alone. <laughs> and then there's, then there's this beautiful woman sitting at the bar who's Mark's friend. And the four of us just like, it was like nonstop conversation from the time we met. So, of course, we had to be at table of four, not at table it, it of two. Was, it was beautiful. So, yeah. for, for all those people who know, for all those people that don't know, I grew up in the great Northwest in Seattle, Washington. And the woman that I'm sitting across to right now, Jean Anderson, was a anchor for a co-anchor and anchor for King Five, which is the local NBC affiliate, for 48 years. I mean, who does that? And so to to top that, not just as an anchor, but the first woman anchor in the U.S. to hold that position, amazing. It is amazing because it makes me sound really old. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I, I, we were just talking about this, uh, Darcy and I were just talking about this um, not too long ago, um, which is you the, the way that you have taken on life and the projects that you're involved in, you've got such a young spirit about you, um, sharp as a tack and love to engage. And I think one thing that I can tell that's probably made you very successful, you've got this natural way about you of curiosity. Yeah, I'm glad that you appreciate my curiosity. My kids don't. They wish that I didn't, you know, show that curiosity when they were like skipping class or not coming home on time or mom, why are you so curious about what we're doing and where we're going? But yeah, I mean, I think that was, uh, I was born being curious and asking a lot of questions. And I mean, it's tough for me to do a podcast where you're going to ask me questions because I want to ask you questions, which I just might. But yeah, I, I have a natural born curiosity. Well, the other thing about that, when you have a natural born curiosity, um, it also makes you a fantastic listener. And and anybody that's in sales, and you're not necessarily in sales. But Everybody's in I sales. Think, say, that's what I was going to say. Everybody's in sales. Um, when you're out there, the, you know, the key to that is not about what comes out of your mouth. It's about what you can take in and listen because it gives you clues on where thing is going to go, who that person is. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, manage managers in the company I work for was actually an owner of the company and a wonderful person. It was a woman-owned company, which I think counts for a lot of how I got ahead quickly. That was my first summit. Yeah. So I know you're, you've already done six. We're going to talk about seven one. summits. But she said, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as hard yeah. as you spend time speaking. And I think that was really good advice. And she also said things that were extremely wise and very succinct, like, life is made up of a few great moments. And you and I both like people. You know, we like to talk. We like to listen. We like to learn. We like to do. But I think what we have in common um, from the get-go is we like to meet new people. Yeah. And so I think it was sort of natural that we gravitated toward each other and toward you know, our friends, our partners. And it's been a nice circle that's developed around us because we're pretty much surrounded by people who like to meet other people. 
It's awesome. I mean, that's what makes the world go around. And, and it helps what, that we both like the outdoors, and here we are in Sun Valley, Sun Idaho, Valley. doing all kinds of amazing things outdoors all day long. It's great. Well, you know, so so again, when I when I when I go and I find people to do these 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 podcasts, right, and I, I want them to be and fill in some kind of a. There's got to be some some element to the conversation about again okay, finding your summit and overcoming adversity and finding your way. And we all in life go through things. I mean, you live long enough and things are going to happen to you, right? And so one of the things that was so fascinating to me is that you were a total trailblazer and uh, early on. So you grew up in Southern California. You went to Stanford, prestigious university, but now you wanted to go on and be involved in, was it broadcasting or was it film? What exactly? Well, at the time I was searching about for a job, I mean, jobs that were available for girls at that time, um, women now, were maybe you could teach, you could be a nurse. Yeah. Um, I, it didn't really occur to me that law school was a possibility. Um, my best friends turned out to be lawyers. I loved the way their brains worked. Um, but there were a lot of things that weren't open to girls at that time when I was growing up. One of the things I couldn't even imagine was being an anchor person because there yeah. weren't any anchor people None. that looked like me. Yeah. And I was really blessed in falling into the company of King Broadcasting, which was woman-owned, uh, but all the managers were men. Uh, but I think that they had a sort of level of support for somebody who had a good education and somebody who was curious and somebody who you know, wanted to make her life in that community because it was a very community-minded company. But I, so I think I had some natural advantages. I had a natural disadvantage for the job I ended up wanting, which was anchoring, the disadvantage being I was female. Yeah. And all the managers were all male, and they had never seen a female um, nightly news anchor, and they thought it would be a financial disaster to, to try me out that way. So, I mean, I think my first adversity wasn't a tough adversity like an awful lot of people face. It was just like they kept saying no. And I guess in addition to being curious, one thing that you might eventually learn about me is that you shouldn't tell me, no, I can't do something, because mm-hmm. then I want to do it. Well, you can say that, but I, I think it's it's kind of like, you know, back in the day, you were crossing the threshold. And when, even though that you're saying that can, somebody says to you, you can't be done, and you're saying, yes, I can, but the policy, not just in, within the city, within the state, but throughout the nation, um, there's just no barrier of getting through, and nobody's ever done it before, right? And so for you to cross that threshold, just like Rosa Parks or somebody else that, you know, is the first and the first and the first to be bold and get out there. Um, and in many of those cases, it was just, you know, walking in or jump, getting on a bus that said you can't sit in this section. With you, you absolutely had to have somebody in charge, it sounded like a male th- uh, figure, to, to authorize it and say, you know what, we're going to roll the dice, we're going to take a chance on mm-hmm, Gene. Mm-hmm. And uh, it wasn't immediate. I mean, I... Th- one of the things that I recall was coming into the job where someone else was assigned to the same job. Someone else was assigned to the same desk and literally the same, yes, typewriter. And she didn't want to use her education to become a typist. And so she said, I really am not going to do this anymore. Well, I'm happy to type. I'm happy to stand up if there's no desk for me. I'm happy to, you know, paint the coffee shop if that's what you have to do to get ahead. Sure. So sometimes when kids say, well, you know, I want a raise. I don't want to do this for no money. I go like, give them a reason to give you a raise. Go do some hard work first and then say, now I want a raise. You know, so I I think you just have to work that much harder, as you know, from, you know, your summits. You just have to train that much harder than everybody else if you want to be the first one who who does something. Yeah, I talk a lot about there's willing and want, right? You want your, so many people want to become that person and, but are they willing to do the things necessary to get them to that place to succeed? And it's usually all those little dots that usually connect to make people um, that successful, especially when you're talking about a 48 year career and really a standard in the state of Washington coming into everybody's living room and, and being really that trusted figure, which you have to be. Um, there's not that many people that go the distance that far or somebody that is going there, but they're so ambitious. Not that you weren't because I know you're, we're going to get into some of these amazing projects you're involved in, but they just see, see themselves, you know, more on the world stage versus the, the regional stage. Right. There's a, a coach who is from the Northwest. 
who you probably know, who said, make the big time where you are. Yeah. And I think for much of my life, I looked, as so many other broadcasters did, to New York or to, uh, you know, a network. And I worked at NBC. I did the Today Show for a while. But in sort of my middle child kind of mentality, I wanted to be someplace where I could balance my job and balance my family and be in a place that I loved, which was the Northwest. And so the big time for me was Seattle. The big time was where you could have the kind of life, not just the kind of job, but the kind of life you wanted to have. Well, there's not that many people that see see it that way. And again, especially when you're talking about not bouncing around at all the different choices that over time, as you know, um, evolved. I mean, originally there was just kind of the big three, right? NBC, ABC, and CBS. And now there's Fox and all these other cable shows that have come to to pass. And, you know, again, to stay as an anchor, anchored at, mm-hmm. you know, as long as you did is really remarkable. So let's get into... Um, can I say one thing about that? Yes, you can. I think that, you know, gender at the time and still for an awful lot of women, they, they face barriers yeah. that they're still trying to overcome um, in, in a lot of different professions. I think that at some point, the fact that you're like the first and you look different from everybody else is an asset. So, you know, I, I don't mean to say, gosh, it was such a hardship. Uh, to grow up female, uh, because if you're the first woman to do something, you get a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. You just better do a good job to yeah. make the way smooth for the people that come after you. I mean, I'm, I'm people who were like, did you know you were the first? No, I was just like trying to do my job. I didn't yeah. think about it. But what I did think about is I don't want to mess up because there are other people watching and you're actually making a way for the people that come behind you and you better do a good job for them. So did you ever feel any pressure off the field, so to speak? Well, I'm talking about when you're at your kids' soccer games or swim matches or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you're there, right? Yeah. And, you know, it was just like me the other night. Um, you know, who, I was, who I'm with, Doris, um, you know, she's from Southern California, so she had no idea who you were. And I'm going, I know that, you know, that's Gene, that's Gene, that's Gene. I didn't want to make like a big deal out of it, but I knew who you were. That was just the fact. So you're in this bar. And I'm sure like... It's such a great story, isn't it? Right? Girl walks into a bar, meets guy. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's not the, me, by the way. That was the only time. You're the only one, Mark. That's the only one. Well, listen, I, you know, <laughs> it's just back when, when I was more in the limelight playing football, right? right? I mean, I had to watch my P's and Q's. I mean, I was never like out doing major crazy things. But at the same time, you just can't... You, you are placed in You're in the spotlight. Place. You're in the spotlight. And yeah. you can't be... You know, there's kids that are looking at you, and there's so many, you know, mm-hmm. you don't realize this as a role model, but you that's what you become for, mm-hmm. for many. Not everybody, for, but for so, many. So th- this is a little diversion, but I always wonder if it's fair to, say, take a football player who's yeah. a star, and that that person not only has to play football well, but has to be a role model for kids. I mean, is that fair, really? I mean... Is it it enough just to be a good football player? Yeah, I I think it just comes with the territory, right? Yes, I think it does. But uh, sometimes I think it puts a lot of pressure on people who are in the spotlight. Like nobody said you also have to be an outstanding role model. They just said you have to play well with the team and you have to do well. But as it turns out, you have to be an example for other people. It's just par for the course and what Mm -hmm. what comes along. You know, you you excel in something and then you someday you wake up and you're like, I can't believe I'm I'm sitting on top of the summit Mm -hmm. and you're playing, you're in the spotlight, you're on on, on TV. And the the realization of that is even though I didn't sign up for it, people are watching Mm -hmm. and you can do so much good too. And so, you know, we're kind of focused more on on not um, putting yourself in positions of compromise but what what you can also put yourself in a position of, of, again, helping others in so many wonderful ways like you do at Children's Hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think in a, a job as a reporter, that's part of what you do. But I mean, I think part of what helped me have a career for a long period of time is I was very much um, and still am very much a part of the community. It's a place where I live. It's a place where I raise my kids. Um, it's a community that I care about, and I want to make a good contribution. And I've always done things that were helpful to the community. Yeah. I mean, we talk about talk about uh, setbacks or summits. I know you've had personal setbacks. I've had personal setbacks. I found myself raising two kids as a single mom. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm scared to death. I have to do this job. I have to raise the kids well. How am I going to do all this stuff? And one of the things, you know, I finally got my feet under me, you know, in terms of my personal life again, what I realized is 
I have a good job. I have family around. I'm really, really lucky. What about the women who have the floor pulled out from underneath them and they have no job and they have no family around? And so one of the first things I really uh, you know, worked hard on was helping women who are either homeless or jobless or through the YWCA in Seattle and King County. I mean, I just felt such an affinity for these people and so lucky that I had a floor underneath me. Sure. I had a job. Yeah, I had to figure out a lot of things. But how about people that don't have a good education, don't have a job, and somebody's got to go to bat for them? Yeah. And that was really the first thing I did. We built a homeless shelter in Bellevue when people thought, gee, are there homeless women and families in Bellevue? Oh, you bet. And we built a shelter that um, has been temporary and now permanent for hundreds and hundreds of women, Yeah, which I think is great. I wish there weren't so many who needed this kind of help, but I'm so glad the help is there. Yeah, it is what it is. So let's get into then balance that you just brought it up. I just Mm -hmm. want to touch on it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times people are talking about you can have it all, right? And so you're shaking your head no. And it's just like you got to compromise somewhere. And I don't know what that is for you. Uh, you were just talking about you were the nightly news, so you're coming on. So you went on at roughly around five and five thirty, six, six thirty, something like that. I was always on a different shift. Sometimes I worked at night. Sometimes I worked early morning. Um, but so I didn't have a regular schedule for very long. It would be is t- pretty typical in anchoring. Your shift changes um, pretty much settled into the early evening, five, six thirty, seven. 9, 10, 11, but, those but, are the anchor shows. Yeah, but those are also the times when your kids are coming home from school, right? right? Well, I, so, so how did you work around that? Uh, the company was very, very understanding because I was not just the first anchor, but the first woman in the newsroom who had a family, who had a job and a family. And the male managers were just like, how can we help you? We, we want to make this work. What can we do? Yeah. And so I said, I would really like to go home at dinner. I want to have dinner with my kids. And that was almost always possible. <laughs> my poor kids, I think about it now. They were both ath- athletes and um, really worked hard in their sports as well as in school. And they would get home and they would be starving. And I would say, we're going to have dinner together. So I have a bowl of cereal. And, you know, when I get home, we have dinner together. Well, these yeah. poor kids are on their seventh bowl of cereal. Where's mom? Yeah. <laughs> and now I think about, you know, what they had to put up with was something. But I think they look back on it and they say, it was normal for us. I mean, so we'd have dinner together. I'd put him to bed. I had a babysitter. And then I'd go back to work. Yeah. And, you, you know, it worked out. I was very lucky that, that the people I worked with and for were so flexible. I have to say that the guys that I worked with were wonderful. I mean, they, they weren't always accepting, and it wasn't always great, but eventually, like the anchor man who had the main job moved over and said, you know, don't look at me for how you should do your job. You figure out how to do your job. Be you. He said, don't try to be me. He had a big, deep voice. He's a big, tall guy, and I, I couldn't be him. And <laughs> well, but he's a great help to me. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of some of the things that you're talking about is where preparation meets opportunity, and then you also get into maybe there's a little luck in there too, mm-hmm. right? Being in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. So you're talking about being around the right management. I mean, you could have told this exact same story, and we could be talking about what uh, uh, trying to find the right word, mm-hmm. like you know, what a negative situation that you found yourself in because. The, the, the men who were running the station, which you said it was female-owned, but say it was male-owned, and they were chauvinistic, and they just they, they, they could have taken a completely different position. It wasn't the first you know job I applied for. I mean, I applied for a lot of jobs and was turned down. And at one time, it was, it was funny, I applied for a news job uh, in Seattle and was turned down. It was actually Ed King. And then I went back to California, and I applied for a job in California, and... I guess I should have known. It was the same manager at King who wouldn't hire me, who then picked up the phone and said, I wouldn't hire you in Seattle, and I won't hire you here in the Bay Area Hmm. either. So that's turn down number two, and then there were a couple of other turn downs. And I was originally hired to work for a film production company and uh, right out of college. So I was lucky, good job, because my background was film production. And uh, about a week into that job, the company folded, and there I am sitting there with my bricks and my boards. And I mean, I don't know what you had when you left college. I didn't have a lot of stuff. So they'd move my stuff up here. And um, now I find myself, here I am. I don't have a job. And that was the the fourth try. And that was the charm. But I think probably like you, I have a pretty positive attitude. Like something's going to work out. 
maybe not the first time, maybe not the third time, but something will work out. Yeah. Well, that's part of life, right? Uh-huh. Just keep chipping away, chipping away, and getting back on the horse and doing the small things that you need to do to get you to that plateau where mm-hmm. you want to go in life. I mean, there's just too many people that will say no, but there's a few that will say yes. Mm-hmm. And you only need one, right? Right. And then that, that propels you over. So over 48 years of broadcasting. Uh, Actually, it's 50 because last week I did a program on King. And you did. it was my 50th year at King. Yeah. Congratulations. It, no, I think it's, thank you, but I think it's really funny because I left there two years ago, took a buyout, and, you know, they let some of the older people, more expensive people go and paid you for a while while you looked around. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's a great opportunity to go see if I can do something else. And um, the something else has turned out to be working at Children's Hospital and focusing on the same thing there as I did at King, which is not just anchoring, but medical reporting. Yeah. And, you know, the health of women and families, that's really my, my big interest in terms of a subject matter. And now working at Children's, I, I do only what I really want to do, which is to work with families and work with kids and work with great doctors and great researchers, and I couldn't be happier. I mean, well, I loved my job at King. I love this even more. Well, you're a free agent, so to speak, right? And mm-hmm. you're, you're doing what you have passion for, and you're so good in front of the camera, right? And just in terms of telling that story and what needs to be told. I'm pretty passionate about the work we do. I yeah. mean, we're currently building a clinic for kids who probably wouldn't, uh, kids in the central area of Seattle, low-income immigrant who might not get medical care if somebody didn't help them get it. Mm-hmm. So uncompensated care is one of the things we do. Building a new clinic. It's called Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. Um, building a new one for the location where our population has moved to to provide really great medical care for them with dignity and with their way paid if they can't afford because we want a healthier community, and it starts with the kids, I think. It always starts with the kids. Yeah. I love that. I yeah. love that. Okay, so. Oh, here some, comes some serious questions as well, glasses are going they, on. They are. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. So you said, I think, uh, the press is your ally, your advocate, your watchdog, oh. and not your enemy. So you're talking about the press, freedom mm-hmm. of the press, right? Mm-hmm. So you were able to go out and do some, some amazing, incredible things. And, and you know, over the course of 50 years of reporting, obviously there's Watergate and there's Vietnam and there's, there's uh, China and there's Russia. Um, tell me about some of the more, more fascinating stories, opportunities for you to, to leave the city of Seattle. And it might have been going to Kosovo. It might have been flying into Russian airspace and landing in Moscow or something. Mm-hmm. It might have been going over to China. I mean, tell me what that was like and how exciting that was for you. Mm. Well, in 1979, uh, when U.S. and China had just started to normalize relations after decades of not being trading partners, not enemies, but not being trading partners, and China was pretty much walled off from the rest of the world. And uh, an attorney that I knew had signed an agreement with the Chinese to bring the first U.S. flagship into China. And he knew that I had wanted to go to China. I used to stare at a blank wall and imagine a picture of China would come up on that wall. I mean, I just daydreamed about it. I read books about it. And he knew I really wanted to go. And he asked if I wanted to go with this crew to be the first local television reporter in the United States to go to China after normalization and cover the first flagship, that's the first jet and the first ship, to come into China in decades. And I said, sure, I'm there. And that's what we did. And um, the first flagship was at the time Pan American. Yeah. And the big banner in uh, the harbor in Shanghai said, we welcome the first scissor ship because uh, the Pan American clipper ship didn't really translate very well into Chinese. And so they said it was a scissor ship. And there were instances like that where it was just so awkward and so difficult because it's like starting to dance with a new partner and so much of what we did um, the lawyers there wasn't a real body of contract law in China at the time and so they had to train certain lawyers in China which was part of part of the growing relationship that the U.S. and China were developing and I remember this lawyer said well who will sign this shipping um, and airline agreement here in China And their representative said, the people of China will. Well, there weren't 3 billion people there, but it was a big populated country at the time. And 
that doesn't fit with U.S. contract law. So, I mean, it's been a long time watching China grow. And I think the reason the company allowed me to go uh, and the reason it was such a compelling story at the time was we were watching China change right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. The sweet, the streets were being swept with um, old brooms and the logs were being uh, sawn with a two ended saw with a guy wow. on either end of the saw yeah. and everybody was on a bike or the f- farms were uh, being, the land was being tilled by farmers with oxen. And I mean, it was just seemed to an American so backward. And you look back on it now, almost 40 years later, and you see the lightning speed with which China has changed and the speed with which our relationship with China has changed. And at, at the time, you know, we didn't have as much of a sense as we do now what an important story that was, is to show our audience in America what this country is, what this country's doing, and what potentially it will become. And they had, at the time we were there in 79, they had people from all over the globe as guests in the Peace Hotel where we were staying in Beijing. Yeah. They were already reaching out to the rest of the world. Mm. Communicating with different Chinese people at that time, mm. how difficult was that? Uh, challenging, because and, and, uh, and, I don't and, speak and, Mandarin. Well, I was going to assume that, but but also, you know, how open were they? Good question, yeah. because um, I was assigned uh, a translator who was obviously highly placed in the party, uh, the Communist Party, and a very important guy, young, um, very pleasant, really helpful, but he was kind of a watchdog for me. He wasn't just a translator. And he later then became uh, the head of a Costco, which is China Ocean Shipping Company, C-O-S-C-O. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was obviously uh, tapped at the time for an important job, that is like squiring this American crew around, and they had better things in mind for him. Um, our, our conversations were sort of awkward and sort of halting, but I found him really, really helpful. And... Um, he, we had personal conversations, which were funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said something about, what do you think about snoring? And I thought, well, is he really saying snoring in English or what's he talking about? <laughs> and awesome. uh, he said that he snored and his wife didn't like it. And what did I think about that? And I'm thinking, what am I supposed to say about that? And he said, she thinks it's just music coming from the inside of the earth. What do you think? And I think, you know, nothing prepares you to answer questions like that. Yeah. <laughs> So it was a great experience. I mean, really so blessed to have been there early, early on and be part of a growing relationship that particularly the Northwest has with China. We have a very different relationship than I think the rest of the country does with China. Sure, They're a very strong trading partner for us. And we have started the University of Washington, your alma mater, one of my uh, alma maters. Um, We've started this university with uh, exchange with the University of Washington and Chinua, which is one of their best universities, um, to cooperate, not just to compete, but to cooperate in technology. And it's a kind of a delicate um, line that we walk, and it's not a line that the current American government really favors. I mean, they, they sort of see China as an enemy, and I think a lot of people in the United States really don't want to make an enemy out of other, other countries, mm-hmm. people to people. They want to get along. We yeah. want the same things. We want peace and security and um, happiness for our families. And I think that's one of the things that, that we got out of it was friends in China that have lasted all these years. Yeah. Well, I've been to China, and it's a remarkable place. And because I'm almost 6'3", you know, they were looking at me like I was crewing with Dual Dubois. I've not been in a major city like you were talking about in Beijing, but I've been more in the rural villages. Exactly. It's just the, amazing. I thought you, know. you were a freak. Thought I was a freak. So tell me about <laughs> tell me about Russia, your experience there. Oh, we um, at King partnered with uh, journalists from Gostel Radio, which is a, a Soviet broadcasting organization, to see if again we could cooperate during the Cold War with a country that was deemed by the powers that be in both countries as our enemies. Yeah, and we had a lot at stake because I don't know if you recall there was a movement called Target Seattle where we realized that the Russians could target us with their weapon systems Mm. and that Seattle was a a convenient target because of all the military installations. It's one of the biggest military bases now in the country and because of all the defense 
um, systems that we had, one of the biggest being Boeing. So the Northwest was nervous about the relationship that was going downhill with Russia. So we thought we'll do these sky bridges, uh, teachers to teachers, students to students, parents to parents, and talk about the things that were on our minds. And we did a series of those, which I thought were helpful in just showing maybe the government thinks one way. The people think, again, the same. We want peace. We want security for our families. We want to be able to move ahead. Yeah. So that was one of the things we did. Um, and what year was this? This was in 1997. Okay. Um, still, still Cold War. Um, was it 97? And you're in Moscow. Fuzzy about that. And you're in Moscow? We were in Moscow. We were in... Um, we went to several other cities, but our base was Moscow, and our partners were Russian, and um, we had a great relationship with them. We ended up producing a show that the I had anchored the Today Show, NBC's Today Show in New York, um, on a fill-in basis. I anchored in Russia their equivalent of the Today Show. Mm. We have three time zones in, in the continental U.S. Yeah. They have... 12 or 13 time zones. This show was live in all those time zones. And we were to bring, bring certain stories to Russian television that they that were of interest to both the war in Afghanistan, for example, which the Soviets had really more than stubbed their toes on, and so have we now. Yeah. Um, what did we think about their adventure in Afghanistan? Well, they pulled the plug on that story that we brought. Yeah. And so dead air across 13 time zones in the Soviet Union because they didn't want to broadcast sure. what we had produced with our Russian partners. The rest of what we... And that, of course, got us the most attention, uh, unintentionally, but that got the most attention for our project. We did four other days of broadcasts with um, Russian television. Me as an English speaker and their Russian host, and then it was translated and it was a great experiment. It was, I mean, for me, it was a personal opportunity to get to know a country and a lot of the people who work in the same field I do. But I think for our viewers and our listeners, it was an opportunity to see, again, people want to get along. They don't want to yeah. have enemies around the world. <clears throat> yeah, that, they want to have allies. I, I found the same thing. I've been in Moscow and, and uh, Leningrad mm -hmm. and down in the Caucasus Mountains. Mm -hmm. I, I climbed four years ago down there, a mountain called Mount Elbrus. And uh, again, what I found is that, of course, we're not necessarily in the Cold War, although it seems like we're moving more in that direction today. Sure. But people are people. And it's the governments that screw it all up. Yeah. And the infrastructure is, at least where I was in the Caucasus Mountains again, is is uh, it, it it is not up to standard. And there's a lot of problems around that. But people just want to be liked. They're curious. They want to know who you are. And they, you know, they're not looking to bomb or nuke us or mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was it was it was a great eye opening experience for me just to see that side of life of always seeing you know, they're red and we're the different color and, mm -hmm. you know, it's always bad versus evil and all this stuff and it's just not true. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfoods. Let me tell you, these creamers are so amazing. They're super tasty, super delicious and what they are is whole natural food ingredients mixed into these creamers and I, I, I'm telling you, when you put this, this stuff into your drink, these powder substance, it is amazing. And their whole tagline is all about fueling your journey. You cannot go and actually power your way up a mountain, uh, be in the pool, ride a big wave, uh, unless you're properly fueled. And these guys are doing it all the right way. So where can you find this? At LairdSuperfood.com. And here's the kicker. If you use the, the, the code name Mark. P20, that's Mark P20, you're going to get 20% off on your first order. So check it out, LairdSuperfood.com. Bad versus evil and all this stuff, and it's just not true. Yeah, I think on a personal level, it's definitely not true. Yeah, no, that's what I found. So you mentioned something else about the Today Show, right? I mean, what a thrill that must have been. I assume that you must have been filling in for Jane Pauley? Exactly. Yep, and, and what kind of experiences was that? It was that? great. It was really great. Um, and, 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 and part of that, did that make you, did that, that pull at you at all? You know, before you talked, I asked the question about uh, being localized and staying committed to uh, the community of Seattle and the greater Northwest. And did being and having that attention and going to New York and doing that, did, did that make you question yourself or second think or anything along the way? No. I was thrilled to have the opportunity 
and I was really happy to go home again. Um, at the time, I had two little kids, and I didn't really think I could raise them in New York as well as and give them the kind of life I wanted to give them, you know, an outdoor life, a, a life around relatives and family. Um, so I was happy to go home too, happy to go back to King and happy to do my thing in the Northwest. How do they pick you? Um, because by, by, actually, by, by this time in life, right, yeah. you were the first, and then that goes, you know, years back. But now you're in a space, you, were, you, you opened up a lot of doors for a lot of women. Um, it was obviously, it was possible, possible that, that uh, having a woman as an anchor or a co-anchor really added to the show with different insights and whatnot. So, so, so now you've got this huge smorgasbord of women across the U.S. and you get picked. I don't think there were that many women um, as anchors. I think we had a really strong newsroom, and I think we had a really good reputation with NBC. We were a really strong affiliate for them, and I think they probably could cherry pick. You know, we could have somebody from Southern California. We could have somebody from the Northwest fill in. We could have somebody from the Midwest. We could um, augment our viewership in these various areas, so it was kind of pragmatic on their part. Yeah. Um, there was also a manager at our company who was high up in affiliate relations, and, and I think he could put in a good word. I wanted to do it. Um, I have a lot of relatives um, on my mom and dad's side who live in New York, so I'd always spend a lot of time in New York, yeah. and I love it. And I thought it would be a really fun thing to do. So, I mean, I applied. I asked for it. I sought help from people I thought would be well-connected to do it, and... Um, couple of years that I applied or talked to people about it, it didn't work out and at this particular time it did so I mean I, I had a blast I thought it was absolutely wonderful I got to work with Bryant Gumbel who was the host of the show yeah. at that point he's mm -hmm. a very very smart guy uh, Willard the crazy weatherman yeah. who, you know Willard took yeah. me out to lunch a few times and yeah. said ah you don't really want this job full time do you and I go hey no I don't I don't <laughs> I like what I do, and I like all of you, and I'm liking the idea of going home. Who I'm, is the most fascinating person that you have interviewed? And that could span from your time in Seattle, these amazing road trips you had to these different foreign countries, or it could be from your time at, at, uh, the, today, at the Today Show. Yes. Um, I think one of the most interesting people I ever met was Jimmy Carter. Yeah. I had an opportunity to interview most of the people who were president during the time I was anchoring. <clears throat> but Jimmy Carter was the most unassuming, non-presidential seeming president. I, I haven't met that many, yeah. but he was definitely old shoe type. And um, we, we were on a plane. Air Force One was flying from uh, an air base in Spokane uh, to Seattle, and the interview was going to be on that leg of his trip across the country. So you've been country. on Air Force One? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, he was up in the front of the plane. I was in the back with the photographer. Uh, funny, I was really pregnant, pregnant as the moon at the time. And um, I'm sitting down looking like Jabba the Hutt. I'm so big. <laughs> he comes walking back to the back of the plane and he goes, hi, I'm Jimmy. And I'm just so struck by, you, you're not Jimmy, you're Mr. President. Yeah. So, you know, from that moment on, the feeling was this guy's surprising. He's not presidential in demeanor at all. Hmm. He had a balled up old sweater like a Mr. Rogers sweater yeah. that buttoned down the front. Sure. And, and he's not very big. He's not a lot taller than I was. Yeah. It just not just didn't seem presidential in the nicest way. Just so comfortable to be with. So comfortable. The funny one of the funny things about that interview years later. Um, when, you know, your kids at some point are not at all interested in what you're doing. And yep. I didn't want to make a big deal of my job. I want to make a big deal of my kids, right? Well, they looked at a video that they, some friend of theirs had, and they said, did you interview Jimmy Carter? And I said, yes, I did. And I said, you did too, because you, you <laughs> see that enormous balloon that, that is was your you. mother? That, that was, was you. you. So you've interviewed the president too. One of the other really, really fun ones was President Obama, because I had gone to high school with his mother. And so they bring the press corps in from various cities, and you know it was Seattle's turn to go interview the president, and you get about two minutes. And the first thing I said was, um, I, I knew your mom. Well, so I got about 20 minutes because he wanted to know what his mom was like. And his mom was a student at Mercer Island High School where I went. And I said, you know, she was quirky. She was extremely intelligent, um, and, and she was funny. And 
so I said, well, what traits do you think you got from your mom? And President Obama said, I got, I'm really funny. <laughs> well, at the time when he was newly elected, I don't think anybody thought he was all that funny. He yeah. was, he seemed kind of a little bit chilly and um, kind of academic, right? Now we know after his term is up, he's got, he's got a very light side too, and he is pretty funny. But it's just struck me funny that he thought he was funny. How many presidents and, have you been able to, to interview? I don't know how many. I haven't counted. It's more than two. Reagan, Ford, Carter, um, who am I forgetting? Obama. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I Bush. apologize. Bush. I apo- Laura Bush was a big hit. Yeah. She was, she, I forgot to tell you something. And she comes beetling back to find me in the White House as I'm leaving. And she said, I wanted to make this point to you. So she goes out to get us and brings us back again because she wants to say something. She's, she, Laura Bush was a pistol. Yeah. Yeah. So I apologize to the presidents in between that I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's fascinating, though. Okay. So finally, we're going to get into your seven summits. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you wrote me a little ditty in an email about what your seven, and I, and I really actually took these to heart. And I took them to heart because I think it just so aligns with, with in life, I think we should all try to make a mark on and for the next generation. So it is so important for me, for example, that, that I want to do certain things that someday when I'm no longer here, my kids can look back and say, you know what, my dad put a dent you know, on this planet, a small little one, but he helped, he contributed. But mo- most of it was that he went after his dreams and passions. Mm-hmm. And those are some of the things I think that you have done. And so, um, uh, again, they're not necessarily, I think, in a chronological order this way, but just the way that you started to, to frame these things up. And the first thing that you said was, as your first of your summits, was figuring out what your talented and skills are. And then once that happens, you can get passion around that, which can really propel you. Um, I think when I wrote you, as you say, this little ditty, I was thinking about, you know, you've done six summits that are, in my mind, just enormous accomplishments. And you're going for the seventh. And so here we are talking uh, kind of as you're on the verge of the seventh. And I, I think I mentioned at the beginning, I, in my mind, I summited kind of early. I mean, I just the opportunity to be a first in a field for women was a big summit for me. And so then what do you do after that? And so in an effort to sort of, you know, talk about your six summits, I'm thinking, well, then what comes after, what comes after the first one when your first one happens kind of early in life? And, you know, I think finding your passion is one of the first things you have to do. And it's hard. I mean, I watch kids struggle, like, what am I going to do? What's my job going to be? And sometimes your passion isn't how you earn your money. Sometimes you have to find a job and your passion is something you pick up later or you do on the side or, you know, you're lucky if your passion is also your job. I was really, really lucky that way. And I feel really lucky now because my passion is kids health and that's my job. So but that, that it took is, me my whole life to get there. Well, yeah, but you're in a unique position too today to look back with, with some reflection and, and thought about, what what people, um, if they're lucky and they put themselves in the right position, hopefully they can get to that point where it's just not a dead-end job and they're really passionate and they can really get behind certain projects that they're doing. Hopefully you can get paid for it. You talked about, or you've, uh, what I just heard was more focusing on these summits that I'm doing today, you know, the six I've done. Actually, of the six, I've actually been on two of them of the same one twice. So I've actually done eight, right? Wow. Yeah. Oh, so you're done. I'm not you can done. Retire now. I'm not done because I've had to do two. I, the only, you only count once when you get up there. But, but the, the point of all this is that, you know, my original passion when I was in third grade living in Seattle was to play football. I mean, I felt like I was born with the football in my hand. Wow. And, and as, as you go up the tier uh, from grade school to high school, fortunate enough to play into college and then on, on to the NFL, you know, People are falling off left and right uh, because it's attrition, right? As you go up and keep, the kids just keep getting better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the thing that made it so hard for me is that after, after 29 years of my life, driving off that cliff, and you've heard this from so many different athletes where you can't play anymore, right? You're done. So that dream, that passion, and I got paid for it. I would have done it for free, but... I got paid for. Don't tell them that. No, I, of course not. But, you know, I went off the cliff and then and it's just like, now where do I shift? 
that energy and that passion. And it took me a number of years to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's how did you figure it out? Well, I think because from football to mountain climbing. Well, it's football to business, you know, and mm-hmm. so that's that's I get going on that, and I started just transitioning all that energy that I had. I go and work out like I did towards a business, and then there's another business and a venture backed one that was eventually sold, and so you know some good things started to happen, and I just got really focused on learning from other elite businessmen in the city of Seattle. I got to know a number of the, the business leaders that were there. There's different YPO groups, YEO groups that I got involved in. And it really started to feed my brain. And so that's where that went. And then seven years ago, I started to go through this tough time. Then I got divorced and everything else. And then that led me to, I need to do something big and grand again. And so I really started doing, and this is like a two-year search of finding something in my heart what I could really get behind. And so I, I didn't want to do something that was just simple, but something that was enormous, something that was big, something that nobody had ever done before. And so after doing some research on the on the internet, I found that no NFL player would ever, ever climb the seven summits. I said, I'm going to be that guy. Mm-hmm. And so it was just a lofty dream. I don't get paid for it. Um, but the, the life's experiences that have come my way from traveling around the world, going to Russia, going to Argentina, going to Chile, going to Antarctica, just even up in Alaska, you know, the way people think, um, it's just been just this incredible learning. The people I've been able to podcast, um, talk about overcoming your, 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 your adversity and finding your way with no arms, no legs or blind going down the Grand Canyon. All these other things have just been amazing to me. And, and, and if anything, I've gotten and received the gift back, but the gift wouldn't have come if action didn't create a reaction Mm -hmm. and by doing, and that's one of the things you've done in your life because these things, the actions of you being in the community and you being behind the mic and anchoring every night and then going over to Russia and going to China and and meeting all these different presidents, it's all come together in a nice package where now you're able to be involved at children's hospital in Seattle. Right. Uh, One of the things that it comes through from what you're talking about is you have to dream it. You know, and then you have to make it happen. You have to try and try and try and try and make it happen. Yes. But you have to dream it first. Like you, I think there's a word f- like BHAG, big, mm-hmm. hairy, audacious goal. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I use that all the time. And I, so I think that you have to dream something really big and hairy. And then you have to make it happen. For me, that was like China. I mean, I'd read all these books and, you know, some of my family was like, yeah, you really have to go. You have to go. And I'm like, how in the world? Now it's like not a big deal to fly to China. But at the time, I didn't really know very many people who'd been there. And so you have to kind of dream it. And you really make yourself believe you can make it happen. Yeah. So one of the things you just talk like, how do you do that, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll you'll see on my refrigerator here at World. HQ. I'm looking at this like it looks like a dartboard of a um, hundred other people. <laughs> well, no, there, there's, there, there's a combination. It's a smorgasbord of different things, but you may see those as pictures and I see those as my vision board. Uh huh. Right. So it's where I've been, where I'm at, and where I'm going. Mm-hmm. And so it's so important for me every single morning when I come down and I open up the refrigerator to have my seven summit smoothie that I make that mm-hmm. I'm looking at these just to, to keep my eye on the ball because I think dreams can come and dreams can go. Mm-hmm. And unless you don't, unless you have that passion and mm-hmm. that strong why about the reason why you're going after that, it, it's just things come up, there's distractions, uh, there's negative voices in your life that just take you in a different direction and it's too easy to lose. There's um, something that's clear to me about you that that isn't really what you're talking about, but you're obviously a very physical person and like doing something very, very um, physical is important to you. Like whether it's playing in the NFL For sure. or whether it's climbing the mountain. And so I think people have to know, like I'm, I'm not an NFL player. Amazing to say that, but I'm really not. <laughs> I'm just a little bitty thing and yes, not that are. strong, but I really have to be active physically and my whole life has been sort of wrapped around whether it's being doing a sport or whether it's being really conscious of my health, but I have to be really, really active. And I think that's something that people have to recognize about themselves. I love to go to the gym. I'm happy in the gym. I'm crazy about swimming. I'm nuts about skiing. I have to be doing something like that. And it really makes me happy. Some people hate going to the gym. Some people don't need to ski, but What is it that makes somebody really, really happy? And then they better go do that. I'm going to tell you. And and I think, 
um, because there's the common tie, I think, with you and, and well, there's common tie with you with your reporting and your anchoring. Okay, that's not necessarily physical, but you're you you have this thirst and this knowledge for learning and understanding and then reporting it, right? And then all these other things you just I, I, talked the, about. What I always think about is like if I can understand something that's really complicated because I'm not that big a brain, but yeah. if somebody can explain it to me, and I can explain it to somebody else, I feel like. I've, I've done something and it's very true in medicine. Like if you can explain something complicated in immunotherapy, for example, to me, then I can explain it to somebody else. And I feel like we've expanded the sort of body of knowledge in the community and people will be better off for it. Where I'm going with all this is, is because everything you just said, I love to do. So I, you know, I've got this BHAG. So I've, there's the ultimate goal. I'm going to Everest, right? So I've got 12 months between now and when I leave to go to Nepal before I take that on. But and, and again, I think you're in the same you're in the same boat. You have a different channel, different vertical. But I love the process. I love getting up every day and going to the gym. I love every day exercising my brain. I love the 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 the, the day to day, moment to moment accomplishment. Yesterday, I went out and ski uh, skied down the hill. Just that's not you know everybody. There's another thousand people up at the mountain too, doing the exact same thing I was doing. But I love that because I knew I, I know that I was exercising my mind, my brain, my soul everything else to help me towards that ultimate goal, right? Can I ask you a question? Of course. Which I asked you the other night, and I'm really curious. Like, I can't imagine what the training is to climb Everest. What you eat, how high you climb every day. I mean, just give me a, like a, a quick capsule of what it's like to train to climb Everest. I can't well, imagine. I, yeah, I, th- I think the first thing is, and, and the same thing happened with football, is that you have to have a very, very, very strong mind. You have to have a very, very strong body. I don't think you can have a strong mind without having a strong body first because the mind is just too easy. I mean, if you're cold and you're freezing, you haven't trained, it's just too easy to quit. And when you stress your body, like I try to do, and and I throttle up as I get closer and then just like a week or two before I go, I'll pull it back just a little bit and I've been doing this for years. But the hardest thing is when I go out there in the morning living at 6,000 feet and it's you know seven degrees, I've got a headlamp on, and I'm skinning from the bottom to the top. Skinning. This is like skins on the bottom of your skis this so you are, can climb upwards. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. It's 3,200 feet, right? And I'm out there for an hour and 47 minutes, right? 37 minutes, something like that. And, you know, Record it's cold. Record breaking speed. Yeah, and it's cold, and it's awful, and it's not fun. And you have to get up, and then, you know, it's pitch black, and there's moose out on the on the tracks or something. It's amazing once you get going. But, you know, the, the more and the more and the more that you do these things, uh, the easier it gets. And so I've found that in addition to learning my craft over all these seven years and all these different mountains I've been on, that this not last mountain I was I just completed, which was Vincent down in Antarctica, somebody asked me, like, how was it? And I said, it was the easiest one I've done. They said, so it's an easy mountain. I said, no, it's probably one of the hardest ones. My temp mate got frostbite on his nose and fingers. I said, what it made it easiest is because of the training and the work I put in put me in that position which now made it the easiest mountain because I wasn't struggling with my nutrition. I wasn't struggling with, oh, it's so cold. You know, I haven't been in this before because I have. I trained at it, right? And so all those different things, I try to like visualize and understand all the different types of conditions I'm going to be in before I go. And then that has really helped me uh, make it through. And just, you know, like anything, the more more you do it, the more experience you get. So some of it is uh, anticipating like the barriers or anticipating the problem, things that you're going to have to deal with. Yes. Yeah. And dealing with them in advance. Yeah. Figuring them out in advance. Yeah, I mean, you would just want to be ahead of the game. I mean, you, you look at ski instructors on 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 on, on the uh, the slopes up here in Sun Valley, and there's a reason why there are expert skiers, and they know kind of have a when it gets sunny, it's this, and when it gets cloudy, it gets that, and when it gets stormy, and and really how to deal with all the, all the different conditions, or it could be a, a avalanche conditions, right? And and people who have not and don't have experience in the mountains. And really don't get it, and they don't like cold and everything else. It's just it's just a lot harder place for them to be. The, the the guy that got frostbite on his nose and his fingers, of which six months later we were on Denali the same time within three days apart, and he was flown off that mountain because he lost three fingers on that. So now he's down to you know he's not very many, not not very many, but but you know he's just a very careless guy on the mountain, and and uh, he was dropping his ice axe and that fell in two water bottles, and you can't be like a six-year-old on these very dangerous places. One of the things I've learned from w- one of the guys that I know that you know, Ed Viesters, yeah. um, who, who's climbed a lot of summits also. Been he on said, this podcast. Uh-huh. I, Ed, 
the, one of the most difficult things is not just going up, but coming back down because people kind of, they back off a little bit. They let their guard down a little bit. And he said more people get injured coming down. It's not even so much about coming down, um, which he's right. He's 100% right. And it's not about letting your guard down as much as you're fried. You've been on a Stairmaster in altitude for 14 hours. And you haven't had much food and you're dehydrated and you've run out of water. And um, I, I, I remember we were uh, last June 7th, 2018, and we were coming across a place called the Audubon. It's a very steep face uh, that goes from about 18,000 feet down to 17,300. And at the bottom of this face, there's... On what mountain? And this is on Denali. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of this face, there's a gigantic crevasse system. It's called Jaws. And it's taking the lives of 23 different people. Yeah, it's just because as you're coming down, you're just stumbling and you're you're clipped in, but it's it's where that brain function doesn't start to kick in because you're so exhausted that you think you've clipped in, but you haven't, and then people fall and trip and then go and fall into jaws. So So a lot of times when I'm in the mountains I think about how absolutely gorgeous they are and how devastatingly dangerous they are yeah. and, and it could be one thing one minute and the other thing the next minute how do you deal with the fact that the mountains have claimed a lot of people that that we know that you know and i know how do you deal with that part of I, climbing I think, yeah i think there's there's two things whether well, there's one there's this bad luck i mean you just happen to be up there on the wrong day and and what i happen to see based on my experience is this there are a boatload of people that should never be on the mountain to start with and I can, every single time I've been on the mountain, I've run into this. People see a movie, they read a book by Ed Vesters, no, sh no shortcuts to the top, and they say, I want to be that guy. And the reality is they're not. I've had guys fall in crevasses. Um, I've had guys get sick. I've had guys wobbling to the top. I've had people sick. I've had people fall over. We've had to put oxygen on people. We had to carry somebody down. They were almost dead. They had jammed themselves with a deck shot. You know, so... I, I've seen it all, and again, every single time you're in this room, and before you've even taken off, you're going, there's no way these guys are going to make it, or if they do, they're going to be on their last leg. And that's frustrating for me because I'm not climbing with a guy like Ed. I'm usually climbing with others who don't have that same experience that I put, I put the work in. So it's not just you getting up to the top of the mountain. It's some of the people that you're going up with Yeah. that determine how it goes. Yeah, no, it's it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So anyways, we will, uh, that story is still to be told for me 12 months from now. We'll come back together and we'll do another Good, pod on this. Good, I can do a this. podcast to You're interview you. You're going to do a pod on me. Yeah, <laughs> that should be so much fun. Listen, it has been a joy, a thrill. And uh, the, the best thing about this particular pod, I mean, this has happened to me uh, oh, probably three or four different times with different folks that, that it, it hasn't just been a one-time hit and one time wonder of of doing a pod and it's been great to know them but then they fly away right and that's it and i really feel like we have a kinship here with our seattle connection and of course with your dear husband i love the guy i'm gonna do a pod on him tell him that and uh with dars and so it's just you know i just love it that you're here in sun valley in the hood and we've got so many commonalities i think it's been a treat to meet you even though we went in a bar, it's, it's <laughs> gone way uphill from there. And a treat to talk with you. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the chance that we've had um, to have dinner together and to have a podcast together and yeah. look forward to what else we do in the future together. We got more stuff. Okay, yeah. she is Jean Anderson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So... Until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.